Today. <laughs> where was I? Where was I? Between video being Brian loves that when I say we videoed. <laughs> when you're married to a professional photographer, you know what to push his buttons with. <laughs> <laughs> right Sorry. All right, guess what's coming up in 10, 15 days? I don't know. Oh, oh yeah, that too. That's actually super cool. That's yeah. the election. The election. Oh, oh thank God it's gonna be over. So, and regardless of the election, um, I think it was Friday, Thursday or Friday, uh, we've actually been learning in the Women's Bible Study, I shared something that a friend shared with me, kind of a new way of how to do your morning readings, and it's been really insightful. I'll share that at a different time. But anyway, I, I've been getting up in the morning, and I'm like, okay, God, what is it that I need help with? Do I need encouragement? Do I need guidance? Do I need strength? Well, Thursday or Friday this week, he kept putting guidance, kept putting guidance on my heart. I'm like, okay. So I Googled guidance. And um, I think we all need guidance with the election. Friends, if you're sitting here in the church, I really encourage you to use the Bible when you go to elect or go to elect whoever you elect. So in the Psalm, Psalm 25, it's a Psalm of David. This is where the Lord led me. 
And so it's Psalm 25. And it's verse 4 through 6. And it says, Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth Teach and teach me. For you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. Remember, O remember, oh Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown for long ages past. So then I go on to read in the study notes, and it says, David expressed his desire for guidance. Can you read? How do we receive the guidance? The first step is want to be guided, and to realize that God's primary guidance system is his word. So when you go to fill out your ballot, if you haven't already filled it out, use this for your guide. I don't care if it's blue, red, white, purple, doesn't matter. We're not here to do that. But I do strongly encourage you to use this. So let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us a guidebook for exactly what it is we need to do. Whether it's with work, friends, family, illness, financials and a very important election, Father God. We put it into your hands. Father God, be with us. Be with us in our personal needs. Thank you so much for all of your blessings that you bestow upon us each and every day. Be with Brian as he gives your word and sends us your message. Father God, be with, be with um, our worship team this morning and be with all those that aren't able to be with us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we all said, Amen. And you know, when, when Joetta talks about coming up here and, and the whole honk honk thing, um, I don't know how many of you know, but on Thursday morning between 7 and 7.30, I'm out front of the building uh, encouraging people who are going by, and, and I get a lot of waves, and I get I get quite a few honks, um, and we've, we've mentioned it before, every once in a while I get told I'm number one, um, but <clears throat> every once in a while, it's happened, so I've been doing it for about two years now, during the school year, and, and it has happened a couple of times, and here's what has happened. There is one particular truck, one particular truck, it's white, it is lifted, it looks brand spanking new, it is always beautifully clean when it comes by, and he's got a train horn. And he about blew me into the ditch on Thursday morning, and he gave me an idea. So, it might be something to think about, and depending on who you are, it might be something to pray about. So anyway, um, uh, this morning as we, as we get to the portion of our service where, where we talk about uh, joining in, in, in our offering, um, I came across something that I, I thought was kind of interesting, and then, and it spoke to who, well, put it this way, I've been where this, this guy is. During, during church, a teenage boy pulled out a few coins from his pocket to drop in to the offering that was being handed around. He was surprised when he felt a tap on his shoulder, and he turned around, and the man behind him silently handed him a $20 bill. And he was like, wait a minute, he was surprised. He, he was surprised at the man's generosity and wondered why he hadn't dropped it in the basket when the basket had gone down his row. But nonetheless, he put the bill in the basket for the man behind him. Then he felt another tap on his shoulder, and when he turned around again, the man said, That was your 20 that fell out of your pocket when you grabbed the quarters. <laughs> so, may we all give as though what's been given to us is what we're given. Right. That it doesn't, we, may we all give as though it's something that isn't gonna impact <laughs> us in our pocket. May we all give as though it was given to us first. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the way that you love us. Thank you for the way that you continue to bring blessings and resources and provision into our lives. And Lord, I pray that you continue to give us encouragement and vision and direction for all that we do. And may we be exactly who you created us to be to make impact on this world today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, did I bring an announcement? Cheat sheet up here? Okay. Yeah, um, probably not a bad idea. I'll, I'll remember most of it. Maybe. So anyway, so this morning I want to remind you that uh, we're coming up on uh, a few uh, few things. October is our biggest month, believe it or not. You would think maybe December, maybe around Easter, but actually for Christ Church for the West, October is huge with what we do with Trunk or Treat, which is what's up on the screen, what we did a couple of uh, 
Saturdays ago or the Saturday before last with our reverse rummage sale that was an absolute fantastic thing for you because of you guys and what God did in the midst of, of even a rain shower. Uh, it was still a great, great, big blessing. Um, and you know, I will, I will, I will forever uh, remember uh, my father-in-law driving his truck through the ditch out here and, and uh, being able to get up on the road without having to get out and put it in four-wheel drive. I'm still impressed by that. There you go, class platform. Oh, that's dear. Okay. Never mind, honey. It's okay. Um, and so, so anyway, Trunk or Treat is coming up. It's going to be uh, on Thursday. And so what we are doing is we thank you for everybody who has signed up to help. And if you have not, there's still opportunity. Even, even if you're not able to bring a vehicle, there's still opportunity to plug in. Uh, just this past week, a friend of mine who is an assistant basketball coach at West uh, got in touch with me and she said, hey, can you use some apple cider? It's like, well, who couldn't use <laughs> apple cider, right? And so, so she showed up, she goes, I'd like to give you some. I said, well, we could probably, you know, figure out what to do with some apple cider. So she brought 19 gallons oh, of apple wow. cider. So guess what we're having a trunk or treat? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so we're going to have apple cider, and so uh, passing out apple cider could be something that uh, someone might uh, volunteer to do. But uh, uh, we've got a, a couple of uh, new things that, that we're adding to uh, uh, to the event um, this year. We're going to have the, the kid ID kits, uh, where we're going to um, encourage folks to fill out the forms and, and have their children uh, fingerprinted and, and take take those ID kits that are, are then provided for um uh, for families by the centers of the centers of um, oh you know what I'm talking about um, there it all fell out of my head I'm sorry about that let's hope it doesn't happen during the sermon um, but anyway uh, the the those particular ID kits are, are going to be available but we're also going to have a prayer tent uh, this year which uh, we're going to encourage families if they feel any any need for prayer at all. Uh, there'll be uh, folks volunteering to uh, to do that to pray with and for folks. Uh, and we're uh, we're still going to be uh, having our giveaways for a couple of scooters, and so it's going to be a great time. So I, I would encourage you if uh, if you at all can be here, and if you can't, please pray for our event that uh, hearts and lives will be changed. I can tell you, over the years that we've done this, uh, it has really been a positive thing for this church body uh, to build relationships in the community, and quite honestly, it has brought us family. Uh, there are there are people who attend this church now uh, who originally met us at Trunk or Treat, and so that's a, 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 a testament to the fact that our people know how to love well, and so I'm I'm very grateful for that. All right, <clears throat> moving on from Trunk or Treat, um, let you know that uh, women's Bible study is coming up tomorrow. There will be no Christmas choir rehearsal. June is out of town, so there will be no Christmas choir rehearsal. Uh, this week, which would be tomorrow, but there will be women's Bible study. They have a guest speaker coming. Uh, Paula McFeeders is going to come and share her testimony and, and uh, uh, be available for conversation. And, and I, I think that's going to be pretty exciting. So, um, if, uh, if that's something that you're considering, ladies, that I would I would encourage you to be a part of that. Um, <clears throat> Tuesday, we're back to impact with kids. Uh, kids, CC kids, uh, still still happening and growing. Oh my gosh, guys. We had 25 kids on last oh, wow. year. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and that's, yeah, and yeah, it's, it's, it's just growing and growing, and we're very excited, and, and God is really blessing that. So uh, so that's great. Also, uh, we still have room for more. So if you've got uh, uh, if you've got children or grandchildren who you think might like to plug in, uh, we, and we're talking kindergarten through 12th grade, and any, any of those positions, we're, we're still interested. Wednesday night, adult Bible study. Uh, is uh, going strong, a uh, fantastic opportunity to come and ask questions, to be uh, in God's Word, and, and to, to be with uh, those who are, um, well, wanting to, to know the same kinds of things that you do. And, and it's a, a really great time uh, for those of us who want to dive deeper. That's, that's the place to go, is Wednesday Night Bible Study. Starting on November the 7th, the first Thursday, the first Thursday of each month, here at the building at 6.30, this is starting November the 7th, we're going to have something called Pizza with the Pastor. And what that is, is on Sunday mornings, like today, I don't have time to talk to you guys. I just don't. To get from here to the next service and to get things going and done and focused and all of that, 
it, I just don't have the time that I would love to have to sit down and have conversations, answer questions, get in fellowship, um, hear how you're doing, all of those kinds of things. So once a month, I would love to, to give you an opportunity to come and, and, and ask me questions or tell me what's bugging you or what I'm doing wrong or, or, or to find out what the vision is of, of the church or, or how you would like to plug in. We need more Thursdays. We need more Thursdays, okay? And so... Have a Thursday. More than one. More than one. So, <laughs> so, so, so apparently I'm spoken for this Thursday. Uh, anyway, so I, I would invite you uh, to come and, and do that and, and grab a slice of pizza. Have a, well, I'd go 6.30 to, to about 7.30. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if that's something that uh, you would like to do, we'd, we'd love to see you. Um, all right. And then I did want to, I did want to remind you of one, one final thing. Um, we have had a, um, one of, one of ours, one of our own, uh, make the transition into the presence of God, uh, and that was Phyllis Hafner, uh, went home to be with the Lord, uh, and uh, we are going to have her uh, memorial service here at the building on Saturday, uh, this coming Saturday at 1 p.m., and so uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to come and, and uh, help us honor her life that was a, a life well lived, uh, and if even if you didn't know Phyllis, uh, and you were here last Christmas, you knew Phyllis, because that, uh, that table, that craft table, 90% of that Phyllis made. Right. And so, uh, and, and quite honestly, the craft table that we're gonna have put out here around Thanksgiving, I would say more than half of it will be stuff that Phyllis has made. So uh, I would encourage you to come, and, and like I said, if you didn't have the opportunity to know her face-to-face, you're gonna get to know a little bit more about her on Saturday, and uh, I think we're gonna, have a, an opportunity to come together and, and encourage her, her family uh, and and also celebrate a life so well lived. So let's, let's, let's think about that. All right, guys, thank you so much. Let's get back into worship. I'm, I'm done talking. For a little bit. For a little bit. All right. Hopefully these batteries that we're looking at there are good batteries. We're missing June, and, uh, you know, we, we pray. We pray to be good leaders um, up here. And... When we pray, we're constantly reminded that it's it's not about us. It's it's about worshiping God. Right. And I don't know about you, but worship for me is is prayer. It's acknowledging Him for who He is. It's thanking Him for all that He is. And I'm always amazed that while we're called to corporate worship and we love hearing your voices rise up with ours. In fact, sometimes I just want to put my microphone down and just let you sing. But it's amazing to me how in the midst of that, he can still meet with you individually. He meets you exactly where you're at in the middle of all of these people. When you worship, he is with you individually as well as with us as a congregation. So let's stand and worship him a little bit more before our sermon. Sing loud.
can sit down unless, of course, you're fifth grade or younger and you're coming up here to hang out with me. I am going to need one of those, and we're going to need some receipts because we got we got a crowd today. You guys are going to be thrilled to know that I have re restocked the bucket. Okay, got everybody. Christian needs a spot. I think we're good. Yeah, we're good. We're good. We're good. All right. All right, so officially the pastor says, I love all of you people, but they're better. <laughs> you guys look great this morning. I, um, I'm guessing that uh, there's one group of you that came in the same car. <laughs> and that's, that's awesome. So, Christian, how are you doing today? We're, we're on mute. Hang on. Gotta get the right mic. There we go. She's got one. Whoops. Okay. Let me go back to that. How you doing, Christian? Good. Good. I'm glad. It's been a long time. I haven't seen you since Tuesday. You've been good since then? Yeah. 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 So are you getting excited? Yeah. All right. So with all this excitement, let me ask you a question. Um, well, wait a minute. Do you ask a lot of questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you ever asked your mom, um, when something happens, you ask her why? You ever said why? Yeah. yeah, you've asked why. And that's because a lot of us who have been, and, and believe it or not, they've all been your age, Otherwise, they wouldn't be this age, right? And so when they were younger, they asked questions, and they asked questions, and one of the big questions is why. And, and that is quite often a very good question, but unfortunately, there needs to be a little bit more. Did you know that when you ask a question, what is it that you're waiting for when you ask a question? Are you waiting for somebody to ask another question, or are you waiting for something else? What is, what is it that you wait for when you ask a question? By asking an answer. an answer. That's exactly right. When I ask a question, I'm waiting for an answer. But have you ever, let me think about the, how I can phrase this. Well, has anybody ever asked you a question and you answered by asking another question? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. You have done that. And Mary, how about you? Okay. William, you're supposed to say why. And so when we think about it, though, and we ask questions, it's because we want to know something, right? We want to know. But did you know that one of the number one question askers is a guy named Jesus? He asks a lot of questions in the Bible. And what's really interesting is he also gets asked a lot of questions in the Bible. Now, he is one of those people, though, who will answer a question with a question. And for some of us, that might be a little frustrating. However, when we understand that Jesus has a motive behind what he does, then maybe it's not quite so bad. But sometimes, if you ask, if you, so let's say you were trying to decide what to wear, and you said, should I wear these shoes? If I asked you, well, do they match your clothes? That would be answering, a, asking a question with a question, wouldn't it? She's nodding. You can't see her behind the speaker. She's nodding. And so that is asking and answering a question with a question. Because I want you to, add, to be able to come up with the answer on your own. Jesus asks us questions a lot. And he does that so that you and I, so that we can think about things. And so a lot of times, he isn't even necessarily hanging around waiting for the answer when he asks us a question. It's because he wants us to think about what he asked us, all right? So Jesus tells us that, and the reason why I'm wearing this silly t-shirt is that Jesus tells us that we are these two things. Light bulbs and salt shakers? Yeah. No. We are salt and light. And when he talks about being salt, what he's talking about is you and I, who believe in Jesus, sharing it with the world. And when we do that, we flavor the world. Do you put salt on your french fries? No, okay. You put salt on anything. 
There we go. Okay, you almost that was scary. I, I, so, so when we when we are asked then by Jesus to go and be salt, well, he tells us we're the salt of the earth, and then he says, if a if salt loses its saltiness, it's no good. And what he's telling us is, he's saying, you are the salt of the earth. And if you stop going out and sharing your flavor, if you stop being who you were created to be, then you're really not helping anybody. And he says it in a little bit harsher terms, but he talks about salt then being useless. Well, we don't want to be useless in God's kingdom. We want to be able to present ourselves to live our lives in such a way that we flavor the rest of everything that we touch with the salt of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so what that means is, Christians, really simply that we want you to live in such a way that people go, that Christian dude, he's cool, and he knows Jesus, and we can tell. That's what we're talking about. And Jesus says, I want you to be like that all the time. Is that okay with you, Christian? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Still working on that. But you'll get there. And so when we think about it, I want you guys to just understand that Jesus says you're salt and you're light, and he wants you to light up the world for him because of the light he pours into you and share and flavor the rest of the world with the salt that is him in you, knowing, knowing him and sharing him. Okay? Does that make a little bit of sense? All right. So when Jesus asks us a question, it isn't always a good answer. Sometimes it's so that we will think of the answer. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for these great young youngsters, and we ask your continued blessings upon them, that you keep them safe, that you keep them healthy, but Lord, also that you pour your spirit both into and through them in such a way that they salt the rest of this earth. Lord, may they be salty always. May they share the flavor of Christ with everyone. Lord, we can't wait to see what you're going to do next in and through them. Name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, come on down. Here's your bucket. Just practicing for a drunk retreat. <laughs> I love it when they grab something and then look at you like, <laughs> all right. So someone once asked, Robbie, well, his first name is Isidore. And you might, the, most people probably knew him by his last name, Dr. Robbie. But Isidore I. Robbie, he is a, he's a guy who won a Nobel, Nobel Prize, and he won it in science. They asked him how he became a scientist. And Robbie would reply that every day after school, his mom would talk to him about his school day. My kids came home from school, and I would ask them, how was school? How are you? <laughs> yeah, you really had to pry it out of them, right? You had to ask, start asking specific questions. Did you learn anything? No. <laughs> Were you awake? No. Sort of, sort of. Anyway, for Robbie, he replied that every day after school, his mom would talk to him about his school day, and she wasn't so much interested in what he had learned that day, but she always would inquire, did you ask? Good question. Okay. Asking good questions, Robbie said, made me become a scientist. Asking good questions. Asking good questions makes a difference. It makes a difference in science, but as we see in Scripture, it also makes a difference in our faith walk. So, this morning, we're kicking off a four-week sermon series that I'm calling, That's a Good Question. It'll be a series where we look at questions, specifically questions that are asked by Jesus. 
Now, we won't get to but a small fraction of the questions that Jesus asked in this series. And we may come back to this particular idea for a series, well, or two or six, um, because at a later date, because what we're looking at is Jesus has a lot of them. I mean a lot. Jesus, you know, and, and so in this particular series, today, this morning, we are going to look at the questions that Jesus asked just in three different chapters of the same, of the same book. We're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, and we are going to be in chapters 5, 6, and 7. And today, we're going to be in 5. So if you're at all familiar with the Gospel of Matthew, you may know that these chapters are rather well known because they cover something that we would say is the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, it's pretty well known. Uh, it would You might say that it is the first sermon by Jesus that is actually recorded in Scripture. We don't know if it was his, actually his first one, but it's the first one we get access to. And make no mistake, this collection of passages... Well, it isn't the first time that Jesus is quoted in Scripture as having asked a question. Oh, no, no, no. Questions are foundational to the way Jesus interacted with just about everybody throughout Scripture. And in chapter 2 of the Gospel of Luke, you might remember that after days of walking home from the Passover celebration in Jerusalem, because he would typically walk there and walk back home, and it would take a couple of days to get from Jesus' home to Jerusalem and back, and they had been there and they were on the way back, Jesus was separated from Mary and Joseph, right? Um, still, I, I still have PTSD about being lost on Jones Beach in New York City. I know what this is like, right? And so in Luke 2, verses 45 and 46, it says that when they couldn't find him, they all went all the way back to Jerusalem to look for him. They had been two or three days out already, and they went all the way back to look for Jesus. Three days later, Three days. I mean, so I'm just kind of curious what the prayers were like. Lord, remember that kid you gave us? Can we get another one? Right? We lost him. Three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple, sitting among religious leaders, listening to them, and doing what? Asking questions. <laughs> They, when, they, when they found Jesus, the teenage Jesus, son of God, he was sitting among religious teachers in the temple listening and asking them questions. And then, then it seems that he was answering their questions. He was then answering. 47 says, all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Jesus is... The questioner, right? And when confronted with the anxiety of his earthly parents, he is being separated from them, and, and all of the stress that he had, well, I don't know that we can say Jesus caused it, but that happened because of this situation, he asked, Jesus asked, but why did you need to search? Jesus is asking Mary and Joseph, why did you have to search? He said, didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? It seems that Jesus is a questioner from the beginning, right? And not just asking the question most kids ask, which is why, followed by another why, and another why, right? And that is, that's what, we're, what we've experienced, but that's not Jesus. And so if we, if we take a, a quick look into Matthew chapter 27, we also realize that at the end of Jesus' life, he asked a question. All right? Matthew 27, 46. At about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, which means, my God, my God. And I like the way that, that uh, author and pastor Martin Copenhaver put it. He said, asking questions is central to Jesus' life and teaching. Jesus is a questioner. Jesus is not the ultimate answer man. He's more like the great questioner. What Jesus is trying to do, well, he's not trying. What Jesus is doing is he's helping us answer our own questions. <laughs> Jesus asks many more questions, believe it or not, than, than anybody asks of him. It's been documented that in the 
Just in the four Gospels, Jesus asks what have been recorded as 307 different questions. Mm -hmm. And the number of questions that are posed to Jesus, a mere 183. <laughs> okay, you're like, okay, some big numbers, right? I mean, that's a lot of, a lot of questions. And then there are two published studies that state that of that 183 questions asked to Jesus, asked of Jesus, he answered, thank you. <laughs> so we can conclude that Jesus prefers to ask questions rather than to provide direct answers. So while there's so many great questions that Jesus asks throughout the four Gospels, we're going to begin, at least for now, in chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. And at this point, where we're going to land, it's just after Jesus. Well, so, Judd and I like to spend time with friends and going through Scripture in a lot of different ways. And one of the things that we do is we jump into that show called The Chosen. And I know, I know, it's not 100% accurate. It's not, it's, not, it's not the Bible come to life. But what it is is it gives you some vision as to what it might have looked like or felt like for some of these things that have happened. And so, oddly enough, the portion of this series that we're in is the Sermon on the Mount. Now, they take some liberties with it and, and, and is, is to the way it got set up. In Scripture, it tells us that Jesus, the crowd just kind of showed up, right? In, in the show that we're watching, they were printing flyers. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Okay. And, they, and, they, and then that whole part where they, they, they set up something on Facebook, I'm not really buying that. But when we think about it, what Jesus did was he preached what it was time to preach. And so to set the context, kind of set where we're at, we're just going to buzz through the Beatitudes, just because I want it to kind of float around in the back of your mind when we're jumping into the, the questions that we're coming up to. So, starting in Matthew 5, uh, verses 3 through 12, it says this, God blesses those who are poor and realizes their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now remember, this is Jesus saying this, and he's talking to a lot of people, right? They've all come to hear him. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I wonder if anybody was taking notes when Jesus was giving this. Right? Because you, you think about it, you think about it, it, it's not like they were actually able to record him. So, it, you know, how were they remembering this, right? God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. And then he says this. Be happy about it. Be very glad. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted. Basically, he's saying you weren't the only one. The, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. And then Jesus says something that really stuck with me over the years and kind of led me to buy the clothing I'm wearing today. And in Matthew 5.13, he says you're the salt of the earth. And then in the very next verse, he says, you are the light of the world. But before he gets to that second statement, before he tells them that they are the light of the world, Jesus tosses a question into the mix. Act two, actually. And he says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Just that mental image of salt being tossed on the ground, think about this. How are you ever going to get that back, right? 
If the salt is on the ground mixing with the dirt, you're not going to pick up a handful of it and put it on your food, right? Because there's dirt mixed in. And so keep that kind of image in the back of your mind. So Dennis Kinlaw, the former Asbury Seminary professor and Asbury College president, tells a story about when he was growing up in Lumberton, North Carolina during the Depression. And it was Dennis's job as a young boy to rub salt into the meat that his father brought home from hunting. Too bad Tony's not here. <laughs> he would rub salt into the meat until his muscles ached as a child, right? They were sore because of all of the work that he was doing. And finally, when it was thoroughly salted, he would hang it up in the storehouse. And one day, company arrived, so Dennis's mother asked him to go get some pork out of the storehouse. And Dennis ran out and got a big piece of pork off of the hook, and he brought it into the kitchen. He laid it down on his mom's cutting board, and he left. How many of you who have ever asked a child to do something, and the second they did it, they were gone, yeah. right? Because you know why that is, and I can tell you why, because I was that age once. It's because I didn't want something else to happen, right? I didn't want to have to do more. I did that one thing you asked, I did it, and I'm out, because if I hang around, I'm going to end up having to do more. Yeah. And so Dennis was out, and he knew, he knew that he was, if he hung around, there was probably going to be more. So he came, he dropped it on the table, on the cutting board, and he bolted. And he was just about at the front door when he heard his mom yell, Dennis! He was like, Ur. Young Dennis knew from experience that whenever his mom screamed his name like that, he was in trouble. So he slunk his way back into the kitchen, and he stood in the doorway. He wasn't going to go in. He's like, no, I'm good. I'm here, sort of, right? Looking up at his mom from the doorway, he noticed she was not very it, but she was staring at the meat. Dennis looked, and he noticed something rather unusual. He would say that this was the first time in his life when he had ever seen the meat move. <laughs> Stepping closer, he noticed that there were maggots pouring out of the slice that his mother had made into the pork. Dennis thought for sure, I'm going to get it now. But all his mom said was, not enough salt, Dennis. Not enough salt. Now, it's easy for us to blame Hollywood or, or what we find on television or liberal schooling or the government for the decay of our culture. But maybe, just maybe, the real problem is not enough salt. And if we feel the world is decaying around us, Problem, problem may be not enough salt. Pastor Terry Laughlin says it this way. In this passage, our Lord is telling his disciples, not just the 12, you need to understand. The, the Bible, when it talks about the disciples, uh, it can be talking about one of two things. It can be either talking about the 12, and, some, and later on the 11, and then again the 12. But it can also be talking about the multitudes that were following him. Right? Those, those who showed up and were fed as part of the 5,000, we would, we would call them disciples because they were following, they were listening, he was teaching them. And so he had this entire mountainside full that he was preaching to, to right? So then he's telling the disciples that true Christian character is like salt. Salt is totally different from the food or object which it is placed upon. Salt is different. Believers are to be like salt, different, different from the world that we are placed into. The power of their lives, of our lives, and the testimony, it lies in being different and being distinctive. James, the brother of Jesus, later wrote, Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, James 1.27, in the sight of God, the Father, God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Be different. Be different. You see, salt preserves. It keeps things from going bad. It keeps things from decaying. And it, believe it or not, it cleanses and disinfects. Right? But if salt loses its saltiness, then it has little or no effect. And in the case of the believer, if we lose our saltiness, our flavor, then we have little chance of helping keep things going or keeping them from decaying. And we certainly can't be 
any part of cleaning or disinfecting the community or the world around us if we are no longer salty. Salt that is tossed out and mixes with dirt is absolutely, as we said before, useless. When dirt mixes with salt, the salt is contaminated and its effectiveness drops significantly. Not to mention, who wants dirt french fries? I believe that this is what Jesus is pointing to, though. Because when the Christian life is truly lived out before the eyes of people in the world, it will cause them to make a decision, one way or the other. It will cause them to make a decision about the Christian faith. God has sent his Holy Spirit to call people unto Christ. Right? I mean, we can agree with that. Amen? Right? Christians who handle and deal with their lives the way that we are called to live we encourage and we draw people to making a decision by what we do, right? We are the example. Some of us not so good, depending on the day. Some of us better, right? So Christians who handle trials and deal with temptation under the direction of God's word, the Bible, are the ones who then are setting the bar, making it attractive, making it, well, Flavorful. It's our obedience to Christ that gives us our saltiness. All who accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord will be preserved eternal. Hmm. Interesting how that kind of fits together, right? Salt penetrates and it spreads and it flavors. It inserts a new quality. It inserts a new substance and life even to a, well, to food that's it can be, you know, well, food can be bland. It can be tasteless. And salt makes it enjoyable. A sprinkle of salt has a widespread effect. It changes that which is put upon. It really does. Obedient Christians likewise penetrate so to flavor the world. And we are called to flavor the world for Christ. True Christians salt those in the world with God's word, thus intriguing them to, as we read in Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Taste and see, he says. Unfortunately, though, many Christians, they overlook their purpose in God's ministry because our purpose in God's ministry is to the world around us, right? And so we find ourselves paying little attention to what's happening to the people around us, to their needs, and, and things are turning from bad to worse, and there's decay, and there's corruption. Those controlled by the world, the, and the flesh, and the devil are corrupting, and foul, and decaying, and they're rotting. These are all things that happen when there's not enough salt. They are bland and tasteless to the Lord. And in the end, God won't tolerate wrongdoing and sin. Remember we talked about it. God's just. It's not fair. It's just. The prophet Habakkuk says, his eyes are too pure to look on evil. He cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So I say that too much salt is being stored up in the church. I think we've got too much salt that comes together and doesn't ever get out of the shaker. Right? The building is not supposed to be salt storage. That's not, that's not how this works. Jesus says that being salt is a good thing. Losing your flavor and ability to be a preservative is a bad thing. So we as believers are called to bring the flavor of God to the world. By doing so, we then point the world to eternal preservation. All right? So... I've got, we're, we, I've got another, we're going to take another turn here in just a second. But before we do that, I'm calling a timeout. And we did something oh, a little bit more than a month ago that I want to do right now. I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to apologize ahead of time. Sorry. Get your phones out, please. Alan, would you put that back up on the screen for me? Ooh, that's going to be hard. Hard to read. There we go. Much better. So here's what I want to do. Alan. Joe, could you hand me my phone? I want to do this again. And here's, here's what we want to do. This is, this is how we spread the salt. Right? We invite 
We encourage people. And so I would encourage you to get the, and the rest of the time I'm going to tell you to put your phone away. But today, and don't worry, honey, I'm not texting you. I do want to encourage you to invite somebody. Right? And what's, what's fun about this is they don't know you're here. Right? Majority of them. Some of them do. But you're about to tell them. <clears throat> the person I'm about to text is they can go back and, and watch me do it. Yeah. Um, and I, I, if you would have, uh, if I would have been thinking this through, I'd have already had mine ready. I know I'm not a good bit older than you guys. Believe it or not, it's Sunday morning and I'm at church. I'm at church this morning. Where are you? Is there any way There we go. Is there any way that I or any way I any words. Any way I oops, somebody got a response. Any way I can be praying for you. And if you, if you think it'll help, go ahead and mention the donuts and really yummy breakfast sandwiches. Um, but is there any way I can be praying for you? Question mark. Sam. Okay. We'll see. If, and, and so if, if you get a response before we're done, um, let me know because uh, we're going to do what we did last time. We're going to, at the very end of the service, we will pray over those people who you just sent a text to. Um, anyway, okay, thank you. Oh. Oh. No, that's, that's when it went. Never mind. Okay. All right, so in Matthew chapter 5, we're going to jump into now verse 46 because this is where Jesus asks another question. But before that, he commands his disciples to love their enemies. Jesus has just told them something that they absolutely do not want to do. He is saying, love your enemies. And that's the what? what, what? You want us to do what? Question that I constantly have an issue with. And, and, and I get it. I know. I know why. I know that it's important. I know that's who we are and what we're called to do. It doesn't mean I have to like it. It doesn't mean you have to like it. But what it does mean is that we are called to do it. And so Jesus then asks them, well, anyway, he says, he asks them to do this. He tells them, he doesn't ask, he tells them, you need to do this. And it seems impossible. And it may also seem like it's what we need to do. If you don't do this, you won't be saved. Mm, not the case, right? The truth is we are not saved because we reach out to people. We reach out to people because we're saved, right? And so... By grace, through faith, we have salvation, those of us who have committed to Christ. You see, it's our response to the gift that we've been given, a gift has, 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 that has changed absolutely everything for the believer. When you accept this gift, it really does change every single corner of your life. All of it. It really does. And so our response to the gift of this of salvation then should be something that is visible to the people around us. It should be visible in every part of our lives, in every day of our lives. It should be visible. So finally, Jesus asks, if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even tax collectors do that much, right? Even tax collectors. Jesus asked this question. Question. It's a question that most likely would have left many during Jesus' day just scratching their heads and going, what? Why are you, what are you talking about? And even from a worldly, unspiritual perspective, everyone loves the people who love them. But the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, nobody gets a reward for that. You will not get $200 and, and get told to pass, pass, you know, go directly home, pass, go directly home, get your $200 because you love somebody who loved you. There is no reward for that. It is its own reward. Right? 
Do you remember the old Geico insurance commercials? Anybody remember those? Where we heard episode after episode. <laughs> Saving money at Geico is so easy, even a caveman can do it. Well, Jesus here is saying that to love those who love you is so easy, even tax collectors can do it. That's what he's saying. And to them, tax collectors were the scum of the earth. They were absolutely the people you would not let your daughter marry. You weren't inviting them over for anything. And they never, ever would have been somebody you'd have been caught dead talking to on the street. Just, they were, they were, I don't know that they were even higher than a leper. I, I they think you might have had a conversation with a leper from a distance, but you would never talk to a tax collector. And so Jesus is saying here to love those who love you is so easy that even those people do it, right? These are the guys who collected taxes for the Romans, the occupying army of the day, and that alone made them the most hated group among the Jewish brothers as they saw them as collaborators. They saw them as traitors. So Jesus is saying even those guys do that. So Jesus' declaration the tax collectors can love those who love them was meant as a challenge. Many of his questions were nothing if not challenging. Tax collectors were associated with a lack of integrity, with poor morals and no loyalty. And even those people find it easy to love family and close friends. Loving your enemies, though, that requires imitation of God himself. Imitation of God himself, since it is such an unnatural thing for human beings to do. I don't care what kind of a super Christian you are. Your first inclination when you are wrong is to wrong back. It is just the way we are built. And God knows it. That's why he teaches us these things. He teaches us to do things and calls us to do things that we wouldn't normally do. Left to our own devices, we would just be us. Right? So maybe the question we should Maybe we should rephrase this question then. Because what I'm hearing Jesus really ask here is, who are you imitating? Right? Because when we're talking about loving our enemies, that requires us to imitate God. Because doesn't he love everyone? Right? No matter who they are, no matter what they're doing, no matter how awful a person they are, God still loves them. It doesn't mean he condones what they do, but it does mean he loves them. So if you're doing the same things that everyone else is doing, there's absolutely nothing special about that. It doesn't set you apart. Following Christ, thinking and acting in a countercultural way, doing it like Jesus, that does set you apart. That is special. That is worthy of attention. Apparently, it's worthy of divine attention. And apparently, if there is no reward for loving those who love you, well, I'm assuming that because of the way Jesus posed this question in Matthew 5, there must be a reward for loving those who don't. That only makes sense. For loving those people who would identify as our enemies. There's, there must be something to that. So, okay. Then maybe I think, all right, I get you, Jesus. I'm not thrilled about it, but I get it. We're called to be different. We're called to be that different. Not a little different. It's a whole lot different. It's a very much different. Different, and it's all because of Jesus. Verse 47, And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? No. It requires no special integrity. It requires no special faith to love someone who is already good to you easy, right? That's the easy part. Now in this verse, Jesus gives us an example of what loving an enemy might look like by greeting them. It meant a whole lot more back in Jesus' day than it means today. If somebody says that I'm going to greet somebody, what, what, what we picture is waving from across the street, basically, right? Uh, I'll say hi, um, how you doing? Um, I remember once in in college, I worked for the student newspaper, and I, I talked him into letting me write a column. And the column that I wrote was 
pretty much a waste of space, but at one point, I wrote something where I asked the question, is what we ask each other as we're passing on campus, and you actually have like a four second connection, right? How you doing? I'm good, and then that was it. Did it, I, what was that? There, everybody is fine, right? Nobody says, oh, I'm having a rough day, I need to talk. No, because we're trying to get to class. We're trying to get to a job. We're trying to get to whatever. And so it was me pointing out that a lot of it was very hollow. This greeting isn't that. What we're talking about in Scripture here, Jesus says that everyone greets their brothers, people who love them. But by implication, what he's saying is that only the truly righteous greet those who are opposed to them, meaning their enemies. So in the context of, of, of this time, to greet someone gladly and mean it required removing any animosity you would have for that person out of your heart, right? Someone who greets their enemies in this way is truly demonstrating God's love for everyone. Easier said than done. This is a love and a righteousness that goes way beyond what is normal for humanity. It's what Jesus, though, expects from his disciples. Like, I came to church to find out that the bar has been raised? Yeah. To those who have been given much, much is expected. Right? I think that, I think that carries a lot of weight here. Author Martin Copenhaver shares a powerful example of a story that he tells. In the 1970s, American Christian missionary Lloyd Van Vactor and his wife Maisie served in the Philippines. Lloyd served as the president of a small junior college, and you might have to help me, Christina, if I get this name wrong. Marawi City? Marawi. Mar Marawi City, okay. The, the school there not only served to educate those in the community, but it also worked to bring together Christian and Muslim future leaders of that particular region to kind of foster peace and understanding. So in 1979, while he was serving in the capacity of that school's leader, 11 armed men kidnapped him from his office. He was held for ransom by members of a Muslim sect in the area. Prayer requests went out to churches who supported the couple. The requests were, were for Lloyd. They were for his wife, Maisie, for the Christian and Muslim communities in the Philippines, and for Lloyd's captors, that they might know the peace of God. Now, some church members questioned why they should pray for Lloyd's captors. Or they said something like, sure, I'll pray for the captors. I'll pray that they come to their senses, and then I'll pray that they get the punishment that they deserve. Right? To add insult to injury, while Lloyd was in captivity, his wife Maisie passed away after an intestinal blockage that the subsequent procedure then led to a cardiac arrest. And so supporters at that time, he's still in, he's still being held captive. Supporters that start responded to to Maisie's death by starting a memorial fund in her name for American women who might want to pursue ministry or social work as Maisie had done. But after 20 days, Lloyd was released as quickly and as inexplicably as he had been abducted. The kidnappers had not even received the money that had been collected for his release. Then the question was asked, well, what are we going to do with the money? Lloyd was given the choice. They said, you figure this out. He, was get, he got to choose how the funds would be used. Well, he also decided that it was, there was a need for a scholarship fund to be established, but not for the American students. Rather, the fund would be a very specifically earmarked fund for students at his school who were part of the very Muslim sect that kidnapped him and threatened his life. Mm -hmm. He had made the decision to love those who had not loved him those who had persecuted and tormented him. You see, he decided to give aid to his enemies. And Jesus asked, if you love only those who love you, what credit is that to you? And I say that embedded in that question is an answer that is unsettlingly, unsettlingly clear. Now that... Lord, thank you for the way that you continue to pour into us and to, to teach us things. 
You show us from different angles all the time what it looks like to hear from you. And Lord, may this morning be, well, another one of those days when we understand that you bring us close to you so that we may be a part of your plan for this world. You have given us all sorts of resources. You have given us your Holy Spirit. And Lord, you, you make us the flavoring for this world, the preservative for this world. And you teach us that we need to be able to love those, well, who quite honestly are unlovable, those who don't love us back, those who might even wish us harm. Because when we do, you point to that and say, that is what my son is like. That is who Jesus is. And may we have the intentionality to want to be more like him today than we were yesterday. And may that continue on all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, and so if you... Um, have been with us before, you know that we are a church that joins in communion every week. And if you are someone who would like to do that and you didn't grab a cup on your way in, go ahead and raise your hand and we will uh, eventually get Rick to come back in here with the bucket. Um, let's see. Stacy, would you ask Rick to come back in and tell him we're ready? Oh, he grabbed it. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Stacey. All right, there you go. You got a couple of takers. Actually, a few, a few more than that, but that's okay. We'll give them, give them just a minute. To, Rick's got to get warmed up. A few laps around the sanctuary ought to do that. Anybody get a response from their text yet? Yeah, good. Oh, when an elder texts the pastor during church, asking if there's any way. Yes, there is. Pray that I have an elder who doesn't jack around so much. <laughs> there we go. I'm feeling appreciated. Thank you. All right. So as we reflect this morning on Jesus, we remember that he left his divine position. Jesus stepped out of heaven. He left a place where everything was perfect to come to a place where everything was a mess. He stepped into our human world. He lived as a man. He was humiliated. He was beaten. And eventually, he was nailed to a cross. He died. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. He defeated death. And he, well, or God, robbed the grave. The enemy thought, that was it. I win. Death take, take, taketh Jesus, right? No. No. That wasn't the case. And he did it for us. He carried every single sin that you and I have ever committed to the cross. And he paid for it. He did it out of love. And he did it for us while we were still sinners. Is this sounding a little bit familiar compared to what we just talked about? Right? He did it for us while we were still his enemies. While we were still far from God. That's how much God loves you. We take communion in, in remembrance of those actions and of that love. The question we must all answer for ourselves then is, how will we respond to being loved like that? So as we take of the bread, may we envision in our hearts the willingness that Jesus had to give up his body. Lord, thank you for loving us in such a way that you were willing to take personal, physical pain because of the things that we did. That you were willing to suffer and to be broken because of your love for us. Thank you for loving us that way. May we never, ever, ever forget that. In Jesus' name we pray. And then, like I like to say from time to time, when we encourage people to read the scriptures, I encourage you to get into the end of the gospel and read. 
read the crucifixion story, read the resurrection story first, and then go back and read what Christ said, because it gives the authority that needs to be behind the words of Jesus when we read that. And so as we take of the cup and be reminded that it is his trip to the cross, it was his blood that paid for our sins and gives authority to everything else that he said when we back up and go back to the beginning, now it makes so much more sense and it means so much more. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for loving us that way. Thank you for sacrificing for us. Thank you for helping us to see clearly how much we are loved. And Lord, the thing we need help with, we knew we needed help getting healed, being cleansed of these sins. Help us to understand the gravity of the situation so that we may be able to be the salt of this earth, to be the light, to be those who love those who are difficult to love. Help us to be more like Jesus, is I guess what we're saying. In Jesus' name we pray. I think this is, after that sermon, um, the perfect way to end.
great she needs to go she needs to do what she's doing these two are fantastic and we're yeah. yeah. uh, I, 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 I want to tell you something and, and many of you um, pay attention to our text in church prayer requests and things like that and, and so I'm going to tell you God has been answering prayer around yes. here, right and, and, and I know you know what I'm talking about uh, but uh, I want to give you just a little specific. Are you okay, Chris, if I share just a, a little bit? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So let me, let, me, let me tell you, sit down for a minute. Sit down. This is going to take just a minute because it's so good what God has done. And so you may have seen recently that we were praying for Chris over here, Sandy's husband, Chris. Yep. He was out on his boat and he was missing. Well, he's obviously not missing now, so we can applaud that. So, yeah. but, here's, but here's what I want to tell you, and, and you can get more details from Chris and Sandy, but, but here's what I want to tell you. At one point, Sandy was praying and praying and praying, and the, the, uh, Chris was out, and they hadn't found him. It was dark, and they asked, the, the, the park ranger asked Sandy, is there a place on the lake that Chris would normally like to go to? And Sandy thought about it, and yeah, there was a cove that she knew of that he kind of frequents when he goes out on his boat. And so she told them that. But Chris will tell you that's not where he was <laughs> initially. However, when the ranger went to look for him, that's exactly where he was. <laughs> when his boat capsized, he was not in that cove. When they went to look for him, that's where they found him. Wow. And that is that's an answer cool. to prayer. Right. That is God at work. And, right. and if you if you even doubt that this God thing is real, I'm telling you it is. Yes. And I'm telling you, our God is still here. He's still active. He's still working, and He's doing it right in front of us. That's right. And so we are. While we are very grateful that Chris is back, mm. we're even more excited as to the fact that God was glorified through that mm. and what He has done. Only God can do that. And 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 to bring about that reunion. Because of his desire to bring the two of them back together <laughs> is a great yeah. thing, right? And so one, I, I want to do one more prayer. And what I want to do is I want to pray for the people that you texted. And I want to pray for continued blessing upon the Fulton family. Lord, we are so grateful for the fact that you continue to do great and mighty works. We have seen that recently, not only in the Fulgums with Chris's rescue, but also with the healing that we have seen in June's grandson and that uh, he was able to, to once again sit up and speak and, and understand what was going on around him after, uh, after a, a scare there, Lord, and we, we are grateful. We are grateful. And we also ask today that 
those that we invite, those that we offer to pray for, would be willing to hear your voice speak into their lives. Would open their hearts to you, Lord. Amen. May it be every single one of us, whether we get a response or not, Lord, may it plant a seed in people's lives that they know that this God cares. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for, for joining us on a Sunday. Invite people. Bring them with you. Uh, you got to tie them up, but it's okay. <laughs> but we are really grateful to have you here. You are a great blessing to us. Have a great Sunday and a fantastic rest of your week. Yeah.